All right, so once again, I'm Don Coleman. It's the Don Coleman Show this morning. Um, so now we're going to start to get a little bit more uh, from just the general wireless into a more specific thing. So we're going to talk about uh, MQTT. And I need to get my speaker notes here one second. And so MQTT is a protocol, and it's going to run, it's going to let our devices connect, uh, talk to a server. So typically, we're going to be running MQTT on devices that are on a uh, Wi-Fi network or on a cellular network. Um, you can't really run MQTT over Bluetooth. I mean, I suppose you probably could, but that doesn't make sense. So really be thinking about cellular devices or Wi-Fi devices here when we're talking about this. You know, why would I want to use MQTT? Why do I care about it? So with IoT, we have an MCU, a microcontroller, or some computer that has a sensor attached to it. And we're going to read a value from that sensor, and we need to send it somewhere, up to a server. So MQTT is one way you can do this. The microcontroller reads the temperature value from the sensor, and then it sends it to the server using MQTT. And now our server has it and can do something with it. And so that works well. Now, we can also do that with HTTP. HTTP, for this case, would probably work just about as well. MQTT is a lighter weight protocol. It's made to run on smaller devices. It's made to use a little bit less bandwidth. Um, and, but it, you know, so in this case, MQTT or HTTP, HTTP could get our data to the cloud. So I think one of the areas where MQTT adds a lot is it makes it really easy to send data from the server back to our microcontroller. So if we have something we want to actuate, we have a light we want to turn on, we have a motor or a fan we want to turn on or off from the microcontroller, we potentially need to send a message from the server back to the microcontroller. And so MQTT gives the microcontroller a way to subscribe for messages, and when the message comes in, it can just act on that. Whereas if we were going to do that with HTTP, we would either have to be polling the server to see what was happening, and so we, you know, we might miss something between when we were polling, or, we're, or if we were polling too often, we would drain the battery on our microcontroller. And so this is one of those areas where MQTT gives us that return path coming back. It's lighter weight, and it works really good for doing these sort of things. They, there is a way to be able to, to subscribe to messages we care about, Whereas if we were doing that with HTTP, we'd have to come up with a way to do that on our own, potentially. So with MQTT, we have this thing called a broker. And a broker is just another name for the server that is handling MQTT connections. Kind of think of the bro MQTT broker like a web server. It handles connections from clients, it receives data from them, and it sends data back to them. It's pretty straightforward, just a different term. And then we have the client, and the client is any microcontroller or thing that connects to the MQTT broker. But it could also be a web browser, it could be a phone, it could even be another server connecting to the broker. So it's basically someone connecting to the broker to be able to send data to it or receive data from it. So when we want to send data from our device or from our client to the broker, we arrange our data in topics. And topics are just a made-up hierarchy. They're used a uh, slash separator, so it looks kind of like a file path. And you really, you make up the, uh, what the path looks like for the data you're going to store and how you want to control access to it. So let's say if we want to put sensors in your house, home would be our root node. And when we have the kitchen, so we have the room that it's in, and we have a temperature sensor. So this could be an MQTT topic. So when I want to report the temperature for the kitchen, we can write to that topic. Or if I had someone listening to what I, my desired temperature is, we could write to that topic and someone would read it. We could also have another one like to control the lights in the basement. So we could have home, basement, light. So our pattern here is location, room, sensor, or device. So we have the topic, which is how we organize the data. The payload is the actual data we send. So when we're writing to a topic, we're writing the payload to it. The payload can be a number, like 72. It can be um, binary data. It could be a string. It could be JSON. It could even be null in some cases. So for our kitchen, if we we're going to report the temperature, we could say, hey, we're going to write 72 to that topic to report that the temperature is 72 degrees. And same thing, we might have another sensor that's doing the humidity and say, hey, the humidity is 57 degrees. 
So for a lot of times building systems, I like to do this. Each sensor gets its own topic all the way down to the sensor level. Today we're going to be using AWS. AWS, Azure, Google Cloud Platform, their IoT platforms really prefer to deal with JSON rather than just deal with scalar numbers. Um, and I think that's just, you know, when you're building generic systems, having uh, JSON payloads is fine. So if we were doing that same thing, I would make up a topic, let's say environment, and then I could write the temperature and the humidity to that environment uh, topic, and I would send that payload to the server. Same thing with the lights. For the lights, we could send a command where we'd say the power is on, the brightness is 75. That's if we're sending it from my phone. Now maybe if I come along and I hit a switch and my lights are smart and report back, the lights could report, hey, the power changed to on and the brightness is 75%. So you can send and receive uh, on the topics. So I have a couple Python examples here. And this is just my housekeeping slide. All of my Python examples would have that at the beginning where we're going to import an MQTT client. And then we have a settings file where we define the broker, the username, and the password. And that's just so I don't have to put big long things in my code here. So the nice thing about MQTT, and this is Python, but there's MQTT uh, libraries from almost any language, and they all work about the same. The nice thing I like about it is it's a very simple protocol, and there's only a couple things you can do. So it's easy to understand. So one of the first things you do is you make a client object. So we say MQTT client. And then we assign a callback that on connect, we basically say, when there's a connection, call this callback function, which is on connect up at the top. All that function does in this case is prints out, I'm connected. We have that nice, ugly uh, function for setting our username and password. And then we call connect to the broker. In this case, the broker is just going to be a URL. And we'll see this in the workshop this afternoon. We're going to connect to the broker using a URL. And then the last thing is this is a Python thing. And we're just saying, hey, loop forever. And that keeps our program running. If our program exits, the connection would die. So this program here would just go, and it would connect to the broker, and it would print out connected. Not very useful, but a good first step. Once we're connected, we typically want to publish a message. So you have to wait till the connection happens. So we would use the unconnected callback. After we print connected, we could say client publish. And so we're publishing a message to the message topic, and the message is hello world. It's really that easy. Now that's not that useful. So if we go back to our temperature example, if our topic was home, kitchen, temperature, we would have some code that would read the temperature from the sensor, and then we'd say client publish topic temperature. And it's going to publish that value 72 to the topic that we have. So we can publish the data to the broker. But if we want to act on that, someone needs to be listening for it. So the similar code like we had before, we can add another callback called onMessage. And that tells the library, when you get a message, call this callback function called onMessage. So now, in our connection, we can subscribe to the home, kitchen, lights topic. So once we connect, we subscribe to that topic. Now when any messages come in on that topic, the onMessage function will get called. This on message just prints out the topic and the payload, so it doesn't do anything useful. But if we were the lights, we could actually listen to that and we could act on it and say, well, what's the power state? What brightness level should I have when we set it? <clears throat> so when we subscribed here, we subscribed to a particular topic, home, kitchen, lights. So that means our program's only going to get those messages. Oftentimes, we want to subscribe to more messages than that. So there's the pound or hash symbol. And this is a wild card. We can use this wild card when we're subscribing to topics. So if in our code we said just subscribe to pound, that would give us every message that comes in the broker. And sometimes if we were like we had something that we wanted to log, we could just subscribe to that, log all of the messages out. Other times we'll want to use this wild card as part of a path. So we'll say home slash pound. And the pound wildcard will go across multiple file separators. So this would filter and get every message that began with home. And it would exclude messages that went to like office and train station and other things like that. So there's another single level wildcard, the plus character. Now you can't use this one on its own. You have to use this in conjunction with a path. So if we said home plus temperature, this filter, if we subscribe to this, would basically give us 
anytime a temperature message came in for any of the sensors in our home. So it's going to get the temperature in the kitchen, it's going to get the temperature in the basement, the living room, et cetera, and it'll filter to only get those temperature messages. In other cases, we may want to put the filter on the end. So let's say we want to get every sensor in the kitchen, we could say home, kitchen, plus. So using a combination of these wildcards can be very powerful to filter to get just the data we want. That way we can have different handlers that are listening for different data doing different things. So QoS or quality of service is one thing. Yes? So in this model, we're only, the sensors are only monitoring what is. It's not like you can send them messages to move the temperature up or down. Or so in this example with the temperature, we were sending the temperature out. And so I'm saying the temperature is 72 degrees in the kitchen. Let's say it's 80 degrees. And I'm like, maybe I have an app on my phone and I can look at it and I say, well, no, I want it to be 72. So I turn that down. I can send a message back to home kitchen temperature. And if there was a thermostat in the kitchen, it could then lower that down. So you can both send and receive. Um, so a lot of what you're doing with these messages is dependent on your application. But definitely keep that in mind that you can send data and receive data. A lot of times these messages look exactly the same. Depends on who sends them, who receives them, what we're going to do with those. So QoS, quality of service, is a term you might hear. And that's just going to talk about how messages are delivered. Um, there's levels 0 through 2, different brokers support different things. I just want you to know about the term. I don't really want to go into that now. Another thing is the last will and testament. Sometimes when you make a connection with MQTT, you can say, Here, here's my last will and testament. And basically what that does is when the broker loses your connection, it will send a message on your behalf. So you can maybe say, hey, when I'm disconnected, send a message to the disconnected topic with my client ID. Um, and so since we're using AWS today, we're not going to do this. There's different ways to handle that stuff with AWS. So jumping into AWS, AWS has something called IoT Core. I always want to call it Core IoT, so I'll use those interchangeably, even though it's not correct. Um, but AWS IoT Core is an MQTT broker. It's a bunch of other stuff, too. It lets us uh, manage devices. It lets us connect data or receive data. It lets us do a bunch of different things. So we're going to be using this in the workshop today and really getting hands on how we implement AWS's broker. Um, all the major platforms have this, but you can also do these things on your own, too, in different ways. One of the big things is controlling access. The stuff we were talking about before, I just assumed we had a broker and anyone writes to it. With a topic, the default on a lot of brokers is if you write to a topic, it comes into, ex comes into existence. If you subscribe to a topic, it comes into existence. On a real application, we'd want to control a lot of those. Like, what do the topics look like? How do we create them? Who can write to them? Um, if you're using a broker called Mosquito, which is an open source broker, you'd make ACLs or access control lists. If you're using AWS, we're going to create these policies. And so we create a policy that says who can connect, what they can write to, um, and, and what they can subscribe to. So it's our way of controlling access. And every platform is going to have some way of doing this. This is AWS's proprietary way for doing this. The other thing about MQTT is it's just a broker. It just passes messages along. If no one's listening for the message, nothing happens to them. They just go away. You can set an MQTT broker to log, but you really want to think about it's just passing messages along. Somebody has to be listening. Somebody has to be acting on something. So you may have a program, a serv another server that subscribes to something to do stuff. Um, in the AWS ecosystem, we can make a rule. And basically, the rule, we provide a query I guess you can read that a little bit. You'll see we're looking for things slash plus slash environment. So we're using a wild card to do it. They have a SQL-like language where we can specify a wild card on a topic and get some data from that. Once we get that subset of data coming into the broker, we can act on it. So these actions here, uh, these are we're splitting the data and running to a Dynamo table and we're writing to a Kinesis stream. But we can do anything we want with this. A lot of times we'll write a Lambda function and then the Lambda function will go off and do something. So here's kind of a more complete view of the system we were looking at before. We have a microcontroller with a sensor and an actuator. We can send and receive data via MQTT to the broker. The MQTT broker talks to other clients. So it may be a phone. It may be another server talking to the broker, subscribing to data. 
I mean, the, the microcontroller and the client are really the same thing as far as the broker is concerned here. We can attach rules um, to our broker, and that's using the um, AWS-specific things, but there's always going to be a way to do this. Attach a rule to look for data coming in and do something with it, like write it to a database, write it to a stream, act on it. So hopefully that gave you guys a good overview kind of of what MQTT is. I think as you hear more about it and start to use it, uh, it'll make more sense. One of the nice things about it is it's a fairly simple protocol, so it doesn't take, you, can, you know, using it for a day, you start to understand it more. Um, and I don't know who has my timing. We may have some time for questions now. Four minutes. Okay. So I have time for a couple questions now if people have questions. Otherwise, we can move on to Ken's next talk. Yes, so up front. The MCU in this case is also a client. Yes, the MCU is a client. Clients on either side. Yep. Yeah, so a broker can connect to many, many clients. And the policies we talked about, which aren't shown here, policies are going to determine who can connect and who can't connect. So you can actually Yes, yeah, so the, the question is you could do everything without a server really if you wanted, right. If you have enough things talking to each other over the brokers, you can orchestrate uh, different things to happen. So one of the nice things about MQTT is it loosely couples stuff and allows different devices to talk to each other via convention. Yes? So the question is, what's the, um, the advantage of using multiple levels of topics? And at least in the stuff that we've built, is being able to filter on different hierarchies, especially as your number of devices grows. And you know, you're talking thousands of tens of thousands of devices and not 100 devices. If you have that hierarchy, you're able to select at different levels and run those queries and partition data out. But for certain circumstances, you may just have a topic of just one name and then have everything in your JSON and be able to process it that way. So uh, MQTT is very flexible and it'll let you do either way. Uh, the convention that most people use is to build a hierarchy to, that makes sense for your devices. Yes, yeah, especially on the client side, right? You don't want, if your client was subscribed, or if your microcontroller was subscribed to Pound and had to filter through all those messages, it's going to get a lot more traffic coming to it. Whereas if you can use some sort of filter so that the device only subscribes to things it cares about, the broker won't send the message to the client. And so you'll save a network bandwidth and power usage on your microcontroller. Where does the policy evaluation occur? Is it always at the broker, or do you push it down to the clients, and the clients have some intelligence? So, the, yeah, so where does the policy happen? The policy happens in the broker. The broker is on AWS, the, the policy runs inside the broker. With Mosquito, you're configuring a file with your access control list. So everything happens on the broker. Um, I like to, where possible, keep my clients to have a, the least kind of knowledge. So one, the code's simpler and smaller, and it's tougher to change the code on a device where it's much easier to change the code on the server, or configuration in this case. All right, well, thank you very much. Okay, so